first important aspects to all of it was just one phrase for love and creativity for us all. This is what keeps this thing together without love. None of this would carry on for 20 years. I promise you this, you know, this is beyond money or financial gain. It's about understanding that life is fleeting and creativity is what, you know, encourages and inspires us every single day. Life of an artist is not easy, like at all. You know, if you're looking at it at a long scale position, you will have challenges, you know, what will drive you through all the challenges that will come your way is love for what you do. And when you share that creativity with others, it will feed you when time is tough, you know, and you need support. So I guess this is fundamental to how this community has been together. You know, this is a big, big, big thing for me. I'm Sean Bose, concert visual designer in Los Angeles, California. Today, we're talking to Grigory Karotsk. I probably butchered that, a.k.a. Vidimo Kastadi. He's an international VJ based in Melbourne. He's also the creator and head cheerleader of the VJ Union communities for VJs, including the VJ Union Facebook groups and the VJ Union website, vjun.io. Check it out. Very excited to talk to him. He's an encyclopedia of VJ culture, technology. He's the backbone of the VJ community. Greg, I'm very excited to have you on the show. Thank you. Good to see you, Sean. Nice, nice to finally catch up after all this time. We're going to try to get our heads together. Good to yeah, see you, man. Definitely. I'm excited for this conversation. I guess I'd like to start with your origin story. You started out in event promotion. Was and it? that sort of led you into this world. So how did you get started in event promotion and how did that lead you to becoming a, a VJ and a VJ community leader? Well, my background has always been associated with the creativity. Since I was a kid, I'd, I'd drawn a lot. I'm always been interested in music. When I came to Australia at the young age, one of the gravitational pools that I would see myself going was events. Uh, they really excited me from day one. I had lived in a regional area in Australia first, which was a, a space which created opportunity to explore events. I guess the first step into the world of music industry and events was through being publicist for a couple of bands that are friends of mine. You know, step by step, I became booking artists and booking music, providing bands, and then I was slowly getting into the events industry myself running small events in rock, punk, ska scene first, and later into electronic music when it started to explode, like Australian and international scene. As I moved forward, I learned about multimedia and started to bridge those you know, streams together at some point, and came a BJ years after, which was um, something that I've been looking for and finding as it works out. Yeah, I guess that's part of the foundational steps. Do you remember the moment that you discovered VJing as an art form? As an art form, yeah. And what attracted you to it? Okay, um, I'm, I'm going to mention two particular inspirations that led me towards it. Um, we used to have this major event called Big Day Out. Many, many Australian people would know this. Um, so that was a national tour, that, which was covering Gold Coast, which was a regional place. Sydney, Melbourne, I think, covered Adelaide, and they used to do Auckland as well. Um, so part of the tour, they had this one tent called Boiler Room. Um, and Boiler Room was from the commercial world that was underground at the festival level. And then and the festival used to bring really good sets of artists um, to, to highlight to like the best of electronic music at that time. Um, one of the years, they had a Chemical Brothers who came to do a show with the full visuals on the last um, act. And that show blew my mind, I have to say. This this was watching, you know, screens unroll and then projections come on top of it. And my my little mind blew. You know, just like whatever this is, I don't know what this is, but I want I want to do this. You know, this this was a big, big moment. Things started to kind of sink in and I realized, you know, the aspects of what, you know, equipment they were using and trying to figure out how would they make the content. A bit later, there was another artist called Lindorfen. He was a number one winner for Triple J Unearthed, which was like a major radio station. And he was the first artist to win competition. And he toured Australia and one of the CDC was Mackay, where I was living at the time. 
And he did this Wednesday show, a friend of mine called me and I said, come down, this is going to be amazing. Like last minute call booking, but this is going to be great. So went to see the show and his name, his name is Eric. And I, I watched the show, which he performed with uh, two dancers and another musical uh, support act as well with him. And once again, it, you know, the blow, blowing our mind moment, these were an exceptional performers. And I, after the show, I came up to him and everyone was asking about music. I didn't care about that at all. I just said, tell me everything about the visuals. What did you use? How, what, what is this? And he said, use it our house back in the day. And he said, just have a look at this, look, look at online and you'll find a software and just try it and you pick it up pretty quickly. And so I did, you know, I've got the software to try it out. And like next thing I'm using it already learning other software on top of it right after. So I guess this was my kind of runaway towards the BJ before I started working on my own productions for my own events. Um, but that was a big, big inspiration. Around what time was this? Oh my goodness, uh, I think 2002, 2003, uh, maybe 2001 when some of the events that I saw, so about 20 something years ago. Okay, I think this might be interesting. We'll, we'll get more into uh, software and tools, current and future a little bit later in this conversation, but can you give me a quick timeline of software that you have used for VJing starting with Archaos in uh, 2004 okay, okay. and uh, moving towards contemporary time. Well, since I touched up on Archaos, Archaos was not my major software to use for shows at all. I, I think I only used it just to see what software does. Mm -hmm. um, I think I had grown it in about a week of playing at home. So the, the first major software that probably caught my eye would probably be Resolume, and we're talking about 2.x versions this was um, early early days which yeah. many older vjs would remember uh, and i found it to be really like it's it's like well with me i i linked it up to vcr 2000s i don't know that uh, controller that meaning now as well and it was superb second software that was running parallel to it was open gct which was um open open tool free software exotic was a developer i remember that and i was you know one of the you know, very active users of the software and got into the community of it all just to see what was, you know, was using it, but you know, pretty much every function of the software. And it was handy because you only, mostly you need to use a uh, notepad. So you had a notepad on the right hand and, and you had a V4 in the middle and then Resolume with the BCR 2000 on my, on my left. And to be honest with you, there, there was a point where I figured out some beautiful techniques using them together they would become more liquidy. I don't know how to if it makes sense, but collecting them together in the layering system in video mix on, that was just a perfect combination. That was my first major sort of toolkit for the first two years, two, two years of my career. Among that, um, I, I would try out Golden Jockey, Visual Jockey. There was a software, it's a node based system that would explore. I ended up getting the slices for software called Pilgrim, which was similar. I was testing it. Unfortunately, it's not, it died, which shouldn't have died. That's not the end. Tried to think what else was I using earlier on. Uh, Milldrop, of course. Milldrop was good with Winamp. That was really important. Exploring different random tools that used to come in for a short period of time. Uh, nothing stuck for too long. Um, later in my career, I remember when version three of Resolume came out, I had this like drastic change. Um, I was on the verge of latest tech quite early on. So whatever was new and untested, I'll be the first canary into the mine. You know? So if it's available, I'll try it out. And so when Resolume three came out, it was a completely different mindset. And I decided to completely drop all my Resolume stuff, even though I was really good at it. I decided to challenge myself and to, to push myself in a different mindset. And ever since I've been doing the same, once I get to a certain point of familiarity, I always challenge myself to throw myself into something new because it gives me the opportunity to challenge the flow of how I think about creativity, challenging me to try different software. So carrying on forward, Resolume 3 was a big thing for a while and and they carried on for a while through evolutions four came out five we were very much in a world of after effects and resolute for a while 
as we kind of move forward in, in the timeline, I was really excited to see projects like Spout come to life uh, down, down the track. So years ago, when I moved to Melbourne later, uh, Robert Jarvis was developing plugins for Ableton, which were called Visible Plugins. And so we were seeing the world of uh, Mac users um, going crazy because they had Siphon. And that was a really exciting majority of people buying computers that were buying apples uh, because of Siphon capabilities. You could share software textures between one another. And Windows was on a summons level deployed. And I do recall there was this uh, one uh, researcher from the United States who found a new possibility in NVIDIA graphics cards, uh, things called Inner Loop. And he put a project which he called Wyphon. And well, obviously, Siphon and Wyphon wanted to do Windows. And I was so excited to find that project. And I spoke to Robert on this, and who spoke to his father, Lynn Jarvis, who's an early developer of Spout. And we tried to get that going, but he said someone else has to take over. And so early days, I was really highly involved with um, Spout guys because um, I felt had a big passion for this. And so when we kicked it off for the first few years, my, my, my sort of unofficial role was like a software liaison with the software companies, trying to educate people of this possibility and how we can bring it to the masses. And that, that had a really successful rollout in the first few years, many dozens of software companies added a should they list. So we've been keeping the log of all the tools that are coming in. You know, and I'm so happy to see that project flourishing still. And I think. Lynn is the best ever. So they love that man. Robert as well. So yeah, th these were like a big things for me. I think coming back to more recent years, let's say six, seven years ago, um, I realized that my flow to my performance should not be just video. I decided video is boring. I got sick of rendering, to be honest with you. Like I, I remember all I was doing all the way to the, the last minute of the show is like watching After Effects render go, go to, to the end. And I'm like, this is not how I want to perform anymore. This is, I'm done with this. So I started to look into World of Shaders and through the World of Shaders, I've discovered uh, projects like Magic Music Visuals. That is still probably one of my most popular softwares that I use today. The reason I like it because it gives you opportunity to grab a piece of code that can listen to the sound and um, respond to the sound and my role is to find composition balances and make it work together. And I find that flow sits with me really well. The other tools that I've been using in the last few years um, would be Smoge. I definitely can be a big fan of that one. I like Symmetry. Some people might still have this one. It's no longer active. You cannot buy it for Steam anymore. 3D Space is a really exceptional software. It's kind of like a multimedia bucket of possibilities. It's a lot easier to use than Unity or Unreal Engine, for example. You can just throw anything at it, connect everything through it. You, you can send in Spout and put MDI out, put, put MDI in and get Spout out. You've got all these possibilities. I quite like it for just the experimentational stages. Things like Edge Design, I've, I've used a little bit. Um, I've tried Unity a little bit. I've tried Unreal a little bit. Uh, Z Vector was a really cool software years ago as well. It's no longer working for some reason, but it used to be excellent for Kinect, and it was excellent for creating content. Kinect Drop is a big, big one for me. Um, you know, when you have a database of so many milk files, it's also good to add them and collect them to your mix, and it's all the audio responsive. Um, Heavy Yama, I'm enjoying Synesthesia. It was exceptional as well. I've been um, recently doing a lot of changes of my ISF files to Synesthesia protocol for Node. Um, so yeah, there's a mix, mix bag, Sean. You know, there's so many softwares that I've tried and I'm trying to think what else. Um, probably will we'll come to my mind later, but these, these are the main ones. Yeah, amazing. Uh, that's, a, that's an awesome list. I was not lying when I said you're an encyclopedia of uh, VJ software and uh, technology. <laughs> I'm curious about that. You could sort of keep your finger on the pulse of what's coming out and uh, what's new. And uh, this has sort of been your mindset for a while. And I think a lot of us find out about these things from you. 
but where where do you find out about these things? What's your discovery process for uh, new stuff that's exciting? Well, it's it's a it's a constant scanner that keeps scanning the web regularly. I've got scripts so we're looking for things every day. When I wake up, I, I get like lots of information in my inbox. Um, also, getting to know the community directly, you learn about bases of where things coming from. Um, we have a very active scene, not just like in Australia. We have a lot of talented people in all all parts of the world doing incredible things, like from Japan to Latin America to United States, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, Russia, China. There's so many people from all sorts of walks of life. Middle East is popping and different camps of thought, different tools. Um, every time that you have a new discovery, for example, with the AI technologies coming through, there's a lot of combinations of talking to copy UI and how you can send data from one tool to another. And I guess this it's, it's like a boiling point, you know? So every few days I go and I like, and cut little leaves and show it to people and have a look, have a look, have a look. So it gives people to see what's coming up and what's possible. But for me, it's, you know, obviously scanning GitHub repos. I, I live on GitHub a lot, just finding out the new tech that's coming out on all fronts, knowing people directly, uh, knowing where the bomb spots are in the world. You know, like I'm, I'm also involved in testing software for different companies. So I get to see it sometimes many months or years ahead. So, you know, by, by the time I've used it for a year, this is news to people. So, uh, but I already know where, where it's going to go down the track. And we try to, you know, steer some directions with some companies. And so I just give us advice and suggestions. So, so that's basically kind of like the overall picture. But yeah, you just you have to keep looking, you know, like I also keep an eye on like a Reddit page that I co manage with other people. So there's a lot of these details that help you to see what's out there, but you also keep looking and you invite people in to get more you know, inspirations for everyone else and to get people sometimes out of the comfort zone and try to see some new ways they can create something. I always push for um, new approaches and responsiveness to audio is a big one. You know, how we can take new tools that are super responsive and introduce it to the real performance because that's where you know, magic happens. Like when, when I first discovered, for example, like magic and, uh, Synesthesia, I, they blew my mind. I realized that this is really excellent step in the layer of your systems that you can run. When I perform, I usually have many softwares running, usually three or four, and they're all already responsive. So when I, whenever I have options, I, I choose between sets of layers and audio responsive level. And usually loops for me are like a texture mostly. So I try to keep things uh, that are always sitting in sync with the sound. And I think it's a good idea to apply it to everyone's work as well. And there's more software coming through down the line. I think we'll see big, 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 big year ahead for us. I'm, I'm predicting acceleration point sub in next few months as well. So we'll be talking about it in our community as it comes. Awesome. Yeah. No, that's a cool uh, workflow tip and techniques. Just have a couple of audio reactive generative sources running that you can uh, always pull in and choose between whichever one's doing the cooler thing. You can kind of mix, match, blend, switch, whatever, but you always have something just making cool content in the background. Yeah, very cool. Absolutely. Let's keep going down the timeline a little bit and talk about the inception of VJ Union. What a series of events led you right. to uh, want to start a community for VJs, and uh, how did it start to take form? Okay, really good question. So, I, I don't think this was uh, like a sharp cut into it. It was a gradual uh, transition towards it. So, community development and me has been like a you know bees and carrots um, before I was. Um, focusing on DJ community, I was running a community called Milk Community for electronic music scene in, in part of Australia where I was living. So I was already having some philosophies and approaches to how I manage communities. Uh, they've already been in development. Um, as my career as a VJ started to take you know, place and I started to travel across the country, I, I realized that there are groups of VJs in Australia, but we were very disconnected. Many people did not know about each other. And through my travels and like networking, I started to see that we could do something together. And 
by bringing people into a, like a regular content network where we can share, and we can actually grow and develop ourselves much further. So maybe three or four years into my career as a VJ, we're going back like probably 16, 17 years now. I started working with a few festivals that asked me to take a role of a VJ coordinator. So my job was actually to look for VJs. This was actually a job and I would book them and bring them to a number of festivals. Winter Solstice was the first and then Air Frequency was the second. Um, later I was also doing some other work for other festivals. So this was, um, I guess, foundations towards focusing on Australia and VJ scene in particular. Mind you, everything that I've learned in the first few years in about VJing, it came from community called VJ Forums and VJ Central. This was our granddaddy that started all for many people on the internet. But I felt that in in the space of uh, VJ Central, VJ Forums, Australian scene was very underrepresented. We, there was a like a handful of artists from Australia that were regular contributors, but it was only this drop in the ocean, you know, there's more of us, you know. So I decided that at some point we need to kind of improve that. And so one of the festivals down the line that brought a lot of VJs together was called Rainbow Serpents. And they unfortunately, due to management, mismanagement issues, they, they didn't appreciate us properly as they should have. And they were well, paying us that year. And that was just a lack of problems. That triggered a uh, creation of VJing in Australia for me because I felt that we were, we should never have this situation ever again where we're working so hard and we don't even get a credit for what we do and not getting paid that it was not okay. So I thought we'll just need to come together, we realize that we are a powerful force if we work as one and we should keep this momentum going. And so community VJing in Australia uh, taken shape uh, early days, we kicked that off with a small website and then a Facebook group, which started to grow really fast. And the next next thing you know, we we start to get through receiving you know, from overseas to come and join us, etc. Because I was contributing to it on a daily basis, just keeping news in flowing. You know, everything that I could find, I just dump into it. And so I guess this were like early days and how it started. But yeah, this, this, this is it. Yeah, that's interesting. So it actually did start kind of as a, a workers union. A little bit. Because there was some some problems or that was the inspiration. Did it act in that way at all or uh, not so much? Look, we don't <laughs> necessarily an organizational union per se, but I right. think all, it, all, it, all you have to do is basically realize that if you're working and collaborating together as a community, no one can screw the community together. Like if, if people talking to one another and there's a strong communication basis level for everything, then there's no problem. You will always find ways you can figure out from the problems that come up, you know? So that's how I see it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Word gets out about festivals you don't want to work for. Uh, exactly. You exactly. learn how to deal with problems and help each other, yeah. you know, with what do I charge for this? What computer do I need? You know, all the common yeah, yeah, questions. Yeah. <laughs> Of course. So, yeah, it's good. What I guess do you see as the purpose of VJ Union or and has it evolved over the years? Uh, the purpose. Okay, that's a great question. Well, like okay, well, let's lay out foundations. So when the community started, one of the first important aspects to all of it was just one phrase for love and creativity for us all. This is what keeps this thing together. Without love, none of this would carry on for 20 years. I promise you this, you know, this is beyond money or financial gain. It's about understanding that life is fleeting and creativity is what, you know, encourages and inspires us every single day. Life of an artist is not easy, like at all. You know, if you're looking at it at a long scale position, you will have challenges, you know, what will drive you through all the challenges that will come your way is love for what you do. And when you share that creativity with others, it will feed you when time is tough, you know, and you need support. So I guess this is fundamental to how this community has been together. You know, this is a big, big, big thing for me. I always remind people about it. We translated it to 50 different languages as well. So it's um, spoken and understood in many languages. So this is, this is a big thing. 
as a long term, I think the future goals for the community would to help people be more independent as an artist. You know, there's a there's a lot of people that work not just in the DJing, they have to have a second job and stuff. I'm trying to figure out the pathways for people to take and offering them networking and platform options to share their content to larger groups of artists and colleagues that they can, you know, support each other from, you know. So for many people that joined us earlier on, the hard work has already been done. We did a lot of leg work by bringing thousands of people together. You know, the new groups and communities that emerge, the base of what we've already done, you know, so it's, it's, it's a, it's a, like a layer and cake thing, you know, so I wasn't the first to kick it off. We, we worked with many other communities. We just put a different positive charge to it. We're making sure that we are positive to our members and we can carry ourselves in the best way we can be by supporting each other. As I think we move forward, we need to realize that we need to come together even further because as technology progressing fast, um, that we, we really live in, in unprecedented times at the moment. Just looking at it daily for the last few months, I feel the transformation of capabilities has been going absolutely bananas. I'm not talking about touch designer bananas, we're talking about bananas across the <laughs> world. So for example, I think the big transformation will happen with the ability for non-technical people to create technical outcomes through code especially writing a shader is not easy for example so it takes many years of practice and knowledge and technical abilities and programming skills to do so within a few months from now on there will be more tools that are focused to shader writing and code generation that people can set up uh, we will be talking about it now in the next few months and weeks basically you your ability to express what you want to create for writing that natural language will allow you to create shaders, which you can incorporate into the, you know, your workflow to be audio responsive. That's going to be a big change. Um, and these things will also accelerate. Before you know it, you could probably write and say, I'm, I'm looking to do a 10 hour techno set and visuals. Can you write me a library of hundred different shaders for the first two hours and then give me suggestions. What should I do next? This is the future for VJs. You know, this is potentially toolkit we will be heading towards. This is my feeling. It's definitely going to be a thing already. You can install a local uh, coding generating systems on your computers without even paying people. They just get like a, a model file connected to your choice of UI that you want to interact with it or do it just a prompt service and you just do it locally, generate your code, test it out, make sure it's fine, optimize it, and then use it for your work. You now, this is going to be a thing. You know, this is already been happening with programming language, especially Python, you know, the things you can do with it and also applying it to things like Touch Design and Blender as well. And the other sets of um, future tools that I think will be happening is already is happening is I would call them real time playgrounds. These are the types of tools I like. I guess a real engine is in that category. However, there's a project called cables.gl that I am really excited about. These guys, as well as people like Theater.js, Polygon.js, there are new types of toolkits that not only allow you to create incredible visuals, but also share them through the web interfaces directly. So you can create content in the web environment and you share it to the real-time performance space. Uh, cables now allows you to uh, deal with the secondary screens. So that was an introduction a few months ago. And that basically means that very soon you'll see cable GLVG applications that people will be making this and there's already people making stuff already. We, we touched up on the subject that, uh, on our side already. Then there's more coming. So keep an eye on those. So uh, Theater.js, for example, have introduced this uh, beta option where you have a 3D space and you come in and say, bring me a picture of a house and it loads a picture of 3D house. Then you put a little picture of a doggy in a car next to it and, and then you put a forest around it. Give me a couple of cameras between them and I want you to change the viewpoints of these cameras to the beat, you know, and that's a constant, you know, so you start to work on a different mindset to how you want to perform. You're no longer bound by a loop 
that has a frame rate. You know, you have a OpenGL high level 3D rendering systems that you can incorporate into your workflows. You know, so this is this is what I think we're moving towards, and more and more tools working in that space as well. Unreal Engine doing a great stuff. Unity as well. There's many more. Yeah, you know, but yeah. that's how I feel we're heading. Fascinating. I want to get into that a little bit more in a second. I have a couple more questions about community and things like that. I'm curious as the, uh, you know, you have a pretty high level insight into all these communities. You're watching all of them. Are there any like frequently asked questions that come up that we can just, we can just answer right now? Sure. Over the years, everybody keeps asking the same thing. Do beginners have the same question? Yeah, this come up all, all the time. So this this carries on, not just the free VJ Union channels, like Reddit, so it's got the same. Most common questions are, what computer do I get? What software do I get? <laughs> yeah. So this is, this, this is the first, this is probably the most two frequently asked questions. Um, they're both great questions. Um, my answer to those questions would come with another question is, what kind of artist do you want to be? Um, I, I try not to, you know, pigeonhole everyone into the same hole because everyone is unique, you know, and everyone has their own approach to how they are, what they want to focus on, um, what kind of, you know, some people are really good drawers and they like to draw. In that case, you maybe you need to focus on real-time drawing applications that give you some extra tools within that spectrum, or you might be a programmer, you might be really good at code, then you might try live coding. There's many tools for that. You could be a musician that wants to just to have something to respond to your music while you're performing music live. There are also focus channels, groups for that, you know, and tools, you know. So I, I'm always trying to figure out a little bit more about every person to, to see where they come from. And, you know, there's no one cookie cutter solution for everyone. It all depends on the type of day or which country you land yourself in by asking that question. You will have a lot of potential culminances that, that will be given to you. Um, among those would be use Resolute, use Touch Designer, use uh, like what, whatever, but it's usually those two always first and then everything else after. Th they might be not the best answers for you every time. I mean, Resolute, as we know, is amazing. Then love, love them to pieces for forever. It's a great solution. Uh, I think at the end of the day, it, it's a bit of an industry standard because you can mix stuff really easily. It's a great mixer. You can find yourself in a good place, especially if you're touring. When you come to a show and you have a mapping file situation to deal with, that's the best solution because you can collaborate and share with others. For that reason, it's always going to stick around. But it's not the only software out there. There's many others. Recently, I've been trying to promote this project called Mod V, which is another really good one. It uh, allows you to run shaders and video and it's all exceptionally responsive. Free software that you can compile or download and run it on every platform. And that one is what to teach people on because it gives you like a fundamentals. And my suggestion is always to explore. Keep exploring, don't stick with one. Every single tool will teach you something else about your creative flow. And as much as possible, try to focus on tools that allow you to create everything inside of the program running rather than being reliant on external tools for you to create everything and then to bring it in in the show. For example, if you have tools like Synesthesia and let's say OpenTTT back in the day, once you open and run a program, it's really hard to bring anything in once you're running it. So these are some limitations that I see in some software, but that's just my take on that. Yeah, well, and as you had mentioned before, too, like you might be running uh, a few different pieces of software at one time. So like if you can find those really interesting combinations that work well together or, you know, using tools like Touch Designer or like you, Resolume is also great because it can take in a lot of different inputs. Like you could use that as your sort of hub, but a lot of different things can go into it, not just uh, video loops. So like explore all those possibilities and see what works for you. Yeah, of course. Very cool. Are there any uh, controversial topics that come up either periodically, frequently, or maybe one that's like recently a real hot topic in the VJ world? Um, hot in the VJ world? Yeah. 
Is there anything that really fires people up or maybe controversial? One that comes to my mind is like Lately. the AI conversation. Is it a oh, okay. is it a tool for artists? Is it a tool for a tool. non-artists? Is it the downfall of all of us? Is it the future? No. Well, <laughs> it is. Uh, okay. So if, if you want to bring up AI, this is, well, once again, it's about to come up, right? Right. So here's my take on it. Like I've, I've had a personal journey with trying to, you know, sink into the whole uh, conversation per se. Probably dived into it myself for different papers and trying to experiment with whatever technology was thrown at us as early as possible. Uh, only a year and a half ago, we were still making this uh, dog looking like pictures when AI just kicked, yeah. kicked in and everything looks oh, like yeah. a dog. I the remember deep dream those. one. Yeah. The yeah. dream ones. And that was only a year ago. So, wow. But now, in, in the last probably more than a year, but like, yeah. This is the speed that it, the whole thing accelerated is absolutely insane. From December last year to, to about like the first weeks of this month, I think I've, I've seen so much acceleration and change than in the last 10 years alone. This is how I feel on the subject. I personally find that AI is a tool for us. I have this particular terminology that I've developed for myself. I'm happy to share it, but I believe that we all should become whale riders per se. So whale being technology and us being rider on it. Because without it, we're just swimming in the water. You know, we need to keep walking. And also it will change a lot of things around how we are as artists as well. I think our generation um, will have a new stage in evolution. Definitely. I can start up a local host and start generating content as, as I'm typing. It's crazy. You know, we have a lot of members in our network that have been experimenting with the real-time performances where you can literally, you know, have a camera face to face of yourself. And as you're moving your head, you can, you know, say, make me look like the guy from the sixties cover band, you know, like you can, you can, you can literally go into that direction now already. There are many scripts and I know a few Patreon projects that are currently in that space that people pushing it's just to support artist development in that space. So. I think that's what we will be seeing very much from now on everywhere. So, and that's not to say that it's the end of it. There's more. Um, so we got imagery is almost real time. So you can create images that it's close to 30 frames a second now from 35, even though I've seen examples very soon, we'll start seeing a lot of prompt to video content. So. Why my prediction by the end of the year, many of us will be doing shows where you type your prompt and saying, make this to better or make this to be amazing or like all specifics. And you'll have video content generated that you can dump into your Resolume or any other player that you, you choose. You, you can play it on DLC and send it as NDI or something, you know, I think we'll, we'll have all of this popping very quickly all around us from every direction. So. These are my predictions. As far as hot topic, for people to understand the, how big this subject is, it takes a while to really understand it. It's not overnight thing. It's never it's like, oh, I, I got this. You know, it's it's challenging. It's challenging even for, for myself. You know, you realize that your capability as an artist to like, for example, draw a digital painting, which you spent hours working on, you know, it's, it's a process, long process, and you, you can create it beautifully, but most generative models out there and they, they can do it in seconds and better than you and thousands of you can do it like say generate me thousands of images and go done you know you try to do follow up with the same you know level of consistency you will never do it it's it's just reality so i guess we have to rethink a few things it's definitely not going away we can't reverse the situation back uh, so we need to jump on the whale, as I say, and run with it and learn from what we can do. It will challenge a lot of people, but it will also take a lot of people's abilities to that level. So these are the things that I can see happening within our community conversations. We have, we have some people that are not happy with it. I know that and maybe they're still trying to grasp what's happening in the space. But I think the thing is we're not slowing down. It's acceleration is still happening. We still to see a lot of changes that are around the corner. So give five years where quantum computers will become a thing, or we might be even in a different stratosphere of possibilities, you know? So we, we, we live in the most exciting times ever. 
That's how I see it. We need to address that for ourselves and work together. That's why communities such as Alice is very important. You know, you, on your own, you'll be like wondering, how do I dissolve this? Together, you put the question forward to the community. You say, hey guys, we want to, how do we deal with this? We all gotta raise our hand and say, we'll chip in or we'll figure it out. You know, I guess that's my take on it. Now, um, as for controversial subjects, look, there's a lot of controversial subjects. I mean, sticking to the focus of um, industry that we're in. Mm. What's well, about a Mac or PC? Yeah, like it's and Linux. You know, <laughs> like uh, these are always hot subjects as well. But this on the lighter note, um, but yeah, there's there's many. I guess yeah. whenever they come up, they you can discuss them at the open communities. You know, that's just how I see it. Yeah, I like that. You know, the topics like these, uh, or really any any topic. That's what community is really great for is you can throw out a question. You don't have to come up with the answer. You just throw out a question or you can throw out your uh, take on something and you'll get a bunch of different perspectives that might help you formulate a different opinion or uh, come to a solution that's better. Yeah, it's really interesting. We touched on it a little bit, but what are the challenges that you see the, the VJ community facing? The last few years have been difficult for people i think the lifestyle in general notwithstanding the last few years it can be challenging for people are there any challenges that you see come up in the in the vj community over and over or yeah, yeah. or recently and then maybe we can talk about like how we can help each other out with those things to okay so for, for, for questions like this, this is a really good question. Thank you. Um, I, I want to say something. So we live in a world, in a world. <laughs> in a world. In, in a world. <laughs> uh, yeah. In a dimension. In another dimension. So we, we, we have a community spread all across the world. Okay, mm -hmm. So first of all, the advice that I would take from a musician would always try to reflect your local environment. Not just cultural changes, but also like little challenges that can also happen in some place to another. So something you can do in one country, you cannot do in another country, you know, for example. So there's, a, there's always that, you know, a few years ago, we had a bit of an issue with the, with the slide out of the industry. A lot of people, businesses gone down out of the business. Things are coming back up for some, but I think it, it, it created a bit of a mental situation for a lot of artists, especially that I've been doing it for a while. I'd like to address that somewhat as well with people. Many experience this. It's not just a single case. It's across the world. So, you know, try to overcome it, work through it, and keep smiling and keep working for the future. Um, dream big and set your own goals, and you will achieve everything that you see clearly in your mind because that's how powerful we are. You know, so there's always that advice. As far as challenges in the industry, oh my goodness. Yes, you know, BJing, if you give a stick in it and try to live off it, directly as a source of income, it could be challenging. Um, I think that's the big one. I know of many cases uh, where people get the ants, they need to find another job to support themselves. But opportunities are, are growing, you know, I think we, what we need to do is uh, create offers for our clients and for, for the public around us from every position. So rather than saying, oh, look, check out my beautiful piece of picture that I just made, you're saying, Hey, this is a beautiful picture. You can also get this picture as a printed out frame that you can buy for X dollars. You know, so with every opportunity, try to create offers. That is a really good solution to this. And I'm trying to advise it to myself as well, which I'm working on. But this is a good one to, to apply it to. So if you are challenged by finding income, then try to work on content that you can offer to people for sale. You know, not just for artists like yourself to buy it for, for shows, but also for people that like art and want to support you as a, as a person, try to create offers in every single thing you do. So when you're posting a picture about a bed, you can say, hey, I'm writing an event, but at the end of the event, I'm going to put out some NFTs for people from the event art that I created that you can buy for X men dollars and cents or whatever currency you choose. You know, or, Crypto, whatever you want. So I think this is a, this is a big fundamental to how we can grow and support ourselves better. So great offers. So you know, I overheard in some other conversation a few weeks ago, and I really sank with me. You know, the point that I'm reflecting it off is that 
you probably see this in, in your front end communities where people are DJs, especially in producers. They're like, oh, you know, they're always trying to go, oh, go, go. And how many Spotify's have I did play this year? You know, like, and how many YouTube, like, whatever social media that they choose to focus on or go and buy my stuff on Beatport. At the end of the day, here's a problem. People usually put all the eggs into someone else's basket and they try to raise that basket effort for themselves to get a little bit and they're doing it wrong. And I'm, I'm saying what people need to do is rather than saying, go and you know, see how many Spotify plays that I had. Well, why don't you say, you know, here's my, here's my collection of all my music. You can take it all as a member of my community, you know, or make an offer that like, for this month only you can, you can book me for this, for the shows at this price. You literally have to bring your product to the people in front of them. You know, that's, that's the key. So, you know, we as VJs, we can say, where can we gain benefit for long-term income for us? You know, the, there was this uh, movement uh, a while ago where we could create events virtually that we could replay over and over. Stuff that keeps uh, regenerating. A lot of times we do a show and that's it. You know, you get your pay and that's it. You, what can you do? But we need to remind people that, look, you you can, if you like the art, you know, maybe maybe you do a particular piece. Like, yeah, for example, there's a few super groups out there that do like Afterlife and stuff. They do big shows and sell out. But you, you can create merchandise. You know, if you, if you if you do a piece of artwork that can be part of the theme of the show, you can just put it on the print t-shirt company and they'll send it to your customers here and put that out there. You know, so we always have to look for opportunities and create offers. So creating offers is the key. And I keep reminding that to myself and anyone else who's listening to do so. That's probably good advice. No. Yeah. Those are some interesting ideas. I like that. That's something I've been thinking about with the with the YouTube channel. Like what is my purpose of this? And if I want What's to What's my purpose in life? Yeah. But if I you know, if I do want to obviously it takes some time and effort to make these videos. So if I want to get some financial compensation out of it, how do I how do I do that? There's a monetization on, on yeah, the channel. The, the channel is monetized, but it's like you're saying, I'm uh slaving away to create a bunch of views for YouTube's ad buyers and they give me a few sure. cents for every uh you know thousand that I get. Uh that's a lot of work for it's uh, a lot of work. For not a lot of money. I feel the pain. <laughs> but uh you know, I have plenty of things that I could uh share with people that, you know, I'm sure they would rather support me directly. There's a plenty to share my I'll I'll, I'll share my experience. So for the last Two decades, um, basically all the effort that I've been putting into our communities is all paid. Yeah. And there's a, like, as far as returns on what I've put in, it's <laughs> nothing compared to what I've put, it, put in there. You know? it's, <laughs> but it's not about that. For me, it's different. You know, I, I feel, I mean, there are times where you're asking yourself, what am I doing with my life? You know, this is the <laughs> question you're asking yourself. But it's somehow, if I had to go back, would I change anything? I don't think I would. No. I think I'd do everything similarly to this. It's about seeing a big picture and saying some of us have to do this sort of work. You know? I've tried yeah. to jump away from it a couple of times in my life and life slaps me back in and says, what are you doing then? Get back in there. You know what I mean? That, that's <laughs> just what happens. I've tried. Trust me. I've tried. I've tried to be like a normal person, you know, normal, to have like a job where like you just focus on one thing, like a web designer or whatever, full time. And it's like, no, dude, it's not your life path at all. You should go back into your... VJ community development for love and creativity for us all. And if you jump away from it, I'll slap you back in again. You know? So this is, <laughs> this is part of my life. Yeah. 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 And I do, you know, I get the joy out of, out of teaching people things. I get a joy looking at your face. So that's, that's important. <laughs> Whenever I get that sort of feedback, I, it, uh, you know, feels good and pulls me back into it. But, uh, you know, whenever I see the AdSense dollars that come in, I'm like, that is, uh, very small percentage of the revenue that I generated for this company. So I'm not sure I am happy about that. <laughs> well, I, I can tell you something the continuation of the content creation is really important um, sector of industry. You have been writing for about two and a half years now on, the, on your channel, like with the content. Yeah, so pretty seriously. Yeah, yeah, I, I've been watching what you've been doing. So it's, uh, it's one of those things that continue with it. 
like we we got a platform as well and we're supporting each other you by contributing making something and we're sharing it to a bigger audience so you know the most important thing in this whole thing is consistency you know this is the biggest factor that will create growth and that's what i understand like the last few months have been not as consistent for me to publish news because of travel and like moving and stuff but i find that whenever you keep consistent content the the traffic increases exponentially as well so you know before you know it you'll be at uh, you know, half a million views if you can carry on like this you know <laughs> the uh yeah mr beast of vjs we have the audience we have the audience to to see this and then some i think the the world of visuals is not slowing down at all um, there's a need to understand all the subjects um, i believe that feature that I'd like to do more of is um, getting our community members to just have a, like a community conversations on a regular okay. basis. That kind of leads into my next question, uh, okay. which is about members of these communities. What makes a good or bad member or participant in okay. a community like the VJ union community? I, I look at the world for positive lights, usually for positive points of view. So for me, even negative things can be positive, you know, and I'll give you an example. So um, I believe that for mistakes, we can learn, you know, so if, if people challenge you somehow, usually it's a reflection of you as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a better philosophical take on it as well. My, my only thing I'd say is if we keep in mind that for love and creativity for our soul, any people that try to put people down in general, I think this, 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 these are not nice things, you know, so we need to figure out how to lock the people down and uphold and support them. The good people are the ones that contribute the most, the ones that, you know, inspire people, the ones that uh, create tools for innovation. You know, these are exceptional people, in my opinion. First, they would never say good about people. Everyone's good, you know, in my opinion. We all, on our own journeys, I don't necessarily want to divide people. I want to bring people together. That's my job. And the world is full of division as it is. And so we need to kind of reposition ourselves to working together than trying to throw ourselves in different camps. Even even people having different opinions is still fine, in my opinion. So if you like one thing versus another, it's a okay. Teach me about what you like about your thing so I can try to see if I can use some of that knowledge to improve my thing. You know, this is how I like to see things. Does that For make sure. sense? No. Yeah. 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 We don't have to, uh, you know, pass judgment, uh, on people necessarily. I guess I'm wondering how people can, in your view, you know, be contributors or make the most of a group like that. Well, I guess it starts with reading. You read. Um, my suggestion is that if you read and just soak up information that way, then act on it. Uh, mm. it you don't have to, you don't, you don't necessarily have to you know, contribute to the group right away. It takes time for people sometimes. Um, I don't expect everyone to be like super user in, in a day, but my general suggestion is to uh, do something daily. This is the biggest thing. And I also remind us to myself, daily continuation and your chosen art form is what keeps you together as an artist. It's simple as that. We have beautiful sets of examples. Everyone else like people, you know, who's uh, been going to try every day. I believe that's the, one of the coolest approaches to keep growing as an artist. You do something every day and you keep yourself and your mind warm on what you do. You know, with that practice, you, you start to go down to, and to warm up, it takes a lot longer. And the older you get, the harder it is to do it as well. So especially if you have a young person, there's a you have sharp brain and you can, you know, learn things quickly. If you, someone that had been doing it for a while, but have a practice your art for a while, that might be a lot longer to come back to the level that you need to be. So general advice is always try to do something every day. You don't have to do it a lot, half an hour, an hour, you know, just to try something, to explore something, try new software, draw a picture of a duck, draw a circle with your hand, try to make it perfect. I mean, anything and keep log of it, you know, keep, keep evolving it from that point on and do it continue on that forward again and again and again and again and momentum of the repetition and continuation of your flow is what will 
uh, elevate you to a higher level of um, creativity. And the more you do this, the better you will become. These are my suggestions on this. Beautiful. Love that. You're very generous with the, with sharing information, which, uh, yeah, not everybody is. No. Some people have different philosophies about that. It is, it is okay. It is okay. What is, uh, what is your philosophy on uh, sharing information? Why are you so generous with the information that you find? There's a simple answer for this. Actually, the more I share, the more I gain. It's as simple as that. It's, it's, it works this way. So the more information I give out, the more information comes to me. It's, it's kind of like, uh, think of it as a cup uh, that like, for example, if you, if a cup is full, you, you have to tip it out before you can put something else in. You know what I mean? This is kind of metaphor for it. I find that there is so many, like a spouse, literally spouts of water pouring from every direction. And I'm just like trying to like, trying to run around and go, it's the water. And I just throw it back at people. Like I'm running to another <laughs> tap and go, oh, they hey, get this, get this, get this. In, in the process of that, I'm, I'm learning a lot, you know, this is, this is the key. Um, I'm learning about different communities that are focusing on things. I, I scan, I scan the internet for different niches of uh, creativity. Like for example, many years ago, I used to follow uh, this community called Pixel from Norway. There's a conference that used to happen for open source technologies in Bergen, in Norway. And so I've been following everything they do. It's, uh, it's basically very niche, very unique sort of space of people focusing on audiovisual arts with open hardware and software. And so I would just read everything they were publishing and learn everything I could find. And later I contribute that information to Linux uh, visual artist community that I also co-manage, Evo. Uh, we have a channel on Facebook and also a website where we publish news for you know, Linux stuff. But then, anyway, there's, there's, there's many of these chapters and I, I just find that one of the exciting parts for me is if I share something to someone, you know, say, Hey, this is brilliant sets of tool that you can use. And if I see someone taking this piece of information and putting it into that little pot and it grows into a tree, it's a happy day for me, man. It's a really happy day for me. That's what motivates me um, to keep going. That's basically how I see, see it myself. Not everyone is like this though. You know, some people mindset works differently and that's fine. Absolutely fine. There's no wrongs here. But for me, I, I get, I get a thrill of, um, seeing evolution of ideas evolving. You know, like if I share a technique or I share a link to something else, one not only takes the idea, but evolves the idea and takes it further. I love that. You know, and I always encourage those that do that to share that point as well, because it inspires someone else to do it. So it's kind of like ever growing inspiration. That exists here. That's what I'm all about. That's what I'd like to do. Nice. Just yeah. uh, planting seeds in, uh, in seeds, everybody's yeah. mind, watching them grow. Amazing. Right. I've heard you talk about this before, but maybe we can get into it. The transformations within the industry over the last 20 years. This is something that you've sort of observed. Is that something that you want to uh, get into? For the last 20 years, I'd say every three years have been instrumental in some sort of change. Usually it co coincides with different toolkits that are coming out. But in the last year, it's been every three months, there's an acceleration in, in changes and the way tools are, it's accelerating high. And so I, I guess there's this one thing that I, I, I want to kind of bring me to that point as well a little bit is with technology changes, we gain something, but we'll lose something as well. Um, okay. And I'll explain. So when I come to the VJ communities, originally I saw you know, a lot of knowledge that have been gained by all the generations of artists before me. They brought something that I don't know. For example, going back to 60s psychedelic evolution in psychedelic art, you know, there's a we follow on. When you have the heaps and the oils and stuff, you know, you put up overhead projectors. This was like a popular style in the sixties for psychedelia um, that created a lot of amazing art. Majority of young generations don't know this. Even my generation doesn't even know this as well, because we, we missed out on that, but there's a lot of knowledge in this, you know? So I remember as I've been with the communities earlier on, for seeing that evolve, I realized that some things that we have had 
techniques that we, we develop, they kind of disappear. So I, I think that one of my personal challenges is to work on obligations that focus on maintaining that knowledge. The history of it all, of it all is really important. We, we lose a lot of information, you know, this is the fact. We have archived all, they made a internet web archive, they made a statistical prediction that every hundred days the website dies. So it's a statistics for the internet. So information that we're putting online is actually disappears quite often. So the knowledge that we gain, you know, if you have it, keep it, but very, very more likely than not, uh, before you know it, it's going to disappear. So we need to work on that as a community as well. We need to learn about techniques that we've learned as a, as a collective. And we need to work on publications that are focused on that. So I'm trying to do as much as I can, but I do need help. So I encourage anyone who watches this and has time and wants to contribute, you're welcome to be part of our community and we have publishing tools to do so. Everything is possible, easy to reach out to me as well, or we can focus on that. Um, I do want to dedicate our community to do more publishing. Um, this will cover history, you know, technologies and techniques and everything. Just for a, a long-term benefit, you know, that, that's why I'd like to see us go do more publications and sharing the techniques and remembering what the what techniques are and how the future techniques can be evolved with all the techniques. So there's a big play field of possibilities in that as well. So I just want to put it out there. Yeah. Amazing. That's a topic that's been fascinating me as well recently. The tools that we're using right now evolved from, you know, analog tools and the digital wow. tools that we're using to create work evolved from analog processes and the, like all these effects that we use uh, used to exist in, you know, video synths and video mixer boxes and things like that. And those are Love developed us. from all sorts of other techniques. It all came from somewhere and we kind of lose sight of those roots. But I think there's really interesting lessons we can learn from going back to discover where these things came from. Yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah, I got to experiment with and play around with some old, you know, like DVD mixers and VHS mixers and, uh, you know, things like that. And it's, it's like, oh shit. Yeah. That's what all this is modeled off of. You know, we're not making anything up. <laughs> Do you know the old technique, how to make like a VHS noise technique is when you just hit, hit the, hit the VHS with your hand on top of it <laughs> and it creates effect. That's the old school filter. <laughs> that's the, uh, that's the distortion the glitch. Distortion uh, glitch. You have to go missed. <laughs> <laughs> it works. It really works. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll have to make a, yeah. uh, a MIDI controller that you just smack with your fist and, uh, only is attached to a, a like a glitch button. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> it just reminded school. me of the, uh, something. Uh, it's awesome. I heard of this like, um, like a alarm clock that someone invented where, when you, when you hear it for the first time, you can throw it against the wall and it stops at the next, uh, 10 minutes later, it starts ringing again. <laughs> I don't know why I thought of him, but. <laughs> that could be uh, an interesting, uh, interface idea. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All like ideas. <laughs> That's funny. This channel obviously talks about Resolume a lot, but yep. what is your current favorite Resolume alternative? Resolume favorite alternative. Sorry, Resolume, but, we love you, but no, Resolume. <laughs> I, I I I love Resolume. Resolume is for like if if I was into tattoos, I probably would tattoo it on myself. You know, I mean? like <laughs> on the arm, like. But um, Resolume alternative. Does it exist? I, <laughs> I I think well, I don't know. It could probably it well with uh, Mad Mapper or IBM. Um, I one of my recent favorites is Tool mm. Three. That's incredible. It's not so much alternative for video mixing, but mostly for um, creating content. I love Smode. That's another one. Experimentally talking, um, Mod V is interesting. I think it's a kind of like lighter version of Resolume in some form. We can do like layers and stuff, and, but you focus on interactive shaders. Mm. So that these are these ones that I probably say, I wouldn't call alternatives, but there could be interesting replacements of sort. Yeah. Something for people um, to check out. Yeah, for sure. Well, the list of tools that I, I talk about is on, on the site, so you can jump on and have a read everything that I publish. Yeah. 
we'll link that up. Let's go into Resolume. I like to ask yeah. people uh, if they have a favorite uh, generator or effect. Oh, my God. Favorite generator or effect. Maybe it's um, most used, most underrated. You can uh, take any sort of. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, uh, I, I don't necessarily use that many effects recently. I'll be, I'm just straight up with you on this one. But like, I mean, you, you have like a different colorization ones that I like. Um, I do recall the one that I was blowing my mind for, for a while. I still have it. It's an interesting one. It's actually designed for for doing projections on domes, but it takes the image that you have and it just turns into dome ready content sort of oh, yeah. system. That one is that one is still on my system, and I I like it sometimes for just a just trippy sort of approach to taking a content and warping it. I like that one sometimes. I don't know how many BGS can leave without the mirror. Mirror is always good, you know. That's a classic. Uh, Auto mask. I think that's probably my most common thing that I use. And uh, layer routing. Oh, that's it. Layer mm. routing is the one. I, I don't think I could live without it now. I can live without Mira. <laughs> without layer routing, it's tricky. So layer routing is really amazing because those that are now you can just bring bring it into your clip sets and then say, even if you have a different group, you say I want you to pull this group set from the other group set, and it's a, a really powerful. Used it on a weekend, actually. That was really helpful for me. Yeah, yeah. That's a great tool to learn how it works. It can solve a lot of problems. All right. It can create a few, too, but it uh, it solves a lot of them. <laughs> I will say this. I'm not going to say what it is, but I will just give it like a hint. So in a group of uh, beta testers for Resolume, there are some exciting things that the team is working on. There's going to be new content types that are going to be brought into the Resolution at some point. Ooh, and some of them come from the web-related technologies. So this is going to be another one down the line. So get excited. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. Yep. Yeah, they're uh, they're making some really cool things. Uh, Very cool. Yeah, wait. It's like this. Love, love, love those guys. Love. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Speaking of the web, you mentioned a few browser-based tools. Do you have any other like browser-based tools that you think are interesting? Okay, okay. So Cables GL, ex exceptional. There is a project that's um, Pavel that wrote an article on our site recently. In a recent conversation, he's been working on the BJ software based at Cables. So that'll be really exciting. Um, I'm a big fan of Theater.js, which is another really exciting project as well for presentation and delivery. And Polygon.js which is another project that I follow. These are the three that are really exceptional. Um, of course, there's more, there's many more, but these ones that have been on my radar. And what they are, like, so for those that don't know what those names mean to you, so Polygon.js is kind of like, think of it as um, Touch Designer and Houdini in one in a browser. It's kind of that sort of level approach to it. It's actually UI looks uh, similar to Houdini. And um, Theater.js, it's kind of like, Unity in a browser where you can bring, it's like a 3D play space. You can just dump things into and put cameras in and fly through and a lot of objects in, exceptional stuff. Um, Gables has you know, been going for the last five and a half to six years now. And it's uh, in a recent development notes, they've said that they're going to make it local based as well, which is going to be super exciting for people. Then we can be are using that for our content and also delivery. So we don't have to render anything to whip out like a video format. So we can literally create it, put it into a browser, but like put it on a server and content can be delivered through it, which you can also control from the controllers remotely, which is becoming like a real time performance methods you can come for that. So yeah, this is, this is a good ones to keep an eye on for sure. Do you have any secret weapons, any like Secret weapons, like yeah. Any tools, yeah, tools, Ooh. plugins, anything okay. like secret people weapon. might not know about, but as a little uh, secret sauce. Pretty much all my secret sauce have been published, but I'll just share it. So <laughs> I use Windows and Linux, generally speaking. The the key element for performance and try to figure out what you want to do next is to how to find it quickly. So one of the tools that I personally use, it's not necessarily a content creation tool, but it's a finding tool. It's called everything, search everything mm -hmm. for Windows. The equivalent of that on Linux is F search. So what that allows you to do is within seconds of looking for it, you can find all your content. 
this is faster than internal Windows search or Linux search or with App Search. Just a really, really powerful tools that you can customize to your liking as well. So for example, if you're writing a show out with Resolume and you know that like you've got your file system in the Resolume, but you want to find the name of the file that you want. If you start looking through search find in Windows, it takes forever, okay? but here's a tip. So if you name your files with a little bit of descriptive elements to what it is. So like, for example, rather than saying go file name.mov or whatever, you can say uh, Sean Bowes uh, doing backflips in grayscale, black and white, 1080p. Uh, this, this is kind of important because if I want to find you, I just go Sean and it, you will come up straight away. I can drag the file into the clip, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. So it's a really powerful and essentially everything is void tools. I think void tools are cool. Yeah. It's a really good software that I, I recommend to everyone uh, because it gives you like a really speedy, snappy approach to finding anything you want really fast. And nice. that's a bot. Yeah. Yeah. That's a bot tip. For that's today. a cool one. On the hardware side, what controller do you use the most? And is there like a fun one, a weird one, a cool one? I'll give you, I'll give you a there from me. So give us a controller collection tour. Uh, so one of them you mentioned recently is this, it's a new Mark II. That's, I really like this one. I use Ableton as well sometimes. So this is mm. so good for Ableton. This is my, one of my favorites, APC Mini Mark II. This is good. I'm a big fan of these guys. Okay, so this is um, in Tech Tools. The guys from Budapest, they're making exceptional, exceptional controllers. So one of the benefits of this is that, I don't know if you've seen or used this, but it's a so cool. So for example, if you plug your USB-C on here, so you work operating and for the show, you want to go do this, you can put it like this and it, it, it will hold different sets of parameters on here. On top of that, you also got a, a button, which is a scene change. So on top of that, you've got three, four, got three, three scenes on top of it. And if you're not happy with this set, you just go, I want to do it again. So two controllers can do this manipulation with extra sets of scenes. It's super, super cool. So I, I like it for portability of it. Just sexy little device. I really like them. Full support to these guys. Love them. I also use for a long time Launchpad XL, which is another controller that I haven't broken it still. It's, it's in, I can't believe it. It's still going. What other ones did I use for a while? Um, a Kai meet like a MIDI mix that I had a previous version with uh, with knobs, but I think that that one is a bit, like retired now. Yeah. I had APC like Akai our classic ones, but I don't use them anymore. There's a bunch of other controllers that I have all around the house. Um, but yeah, these these two are my favorite. Um, Akai APC Mini is really really nice. Really nice. Nice. I want to get my hands on the, some of those Intech ones. I've been looking at them recently. They look really yeah, cool. Yeah. They're very cool. Full support. They've got the new ones just to released as well the other day. It's like you can do jog dial. Here's the thing that like every week there's a massive post featuring a hardware group where we talk about the new controllers and there's usually they come back again all, 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 all over and over. There's one thing that I did see recently and I want to get my hands on it. For synesthesia, there is one... It, I would like to get X and Y controller and I saw one open source and I'm, I want to get it. And so that would be really good for me. Down the line, I haven't got it yet, but just a simple X and Y touch, but it'd be amazing if, if you take guys listening to, to this right now, guys, just make one the same size, but X and Y, I will be like, <laughs> so happy, you know, let me my little dream. Make my dream come true. Nice. I'm, I'm uh, sending this video to them later. They'll be like, oh my gosh, I love yeah. you. I love you too. You just reminded me of it. Is there something, either software or hardware, that uh, that doesn't exist that you want, but you haven't made, and uh, you want to put out to the world? Hey guys, somebody make this thing. We, I, I need it. Okay, okay, <laughs> oh, great question. I think I touched up on this subject slightly in the beginning. Um, so here's here's what can work. So for example, for prompt engineering where you can write code that can be loaded into your systems in real time. That'd be really cool. So using ISF, Interactive Shader Format, you could literally go, right, um, I need fractal sets in this particular style. And you press answer and it loads it into a clip, runs it into Resolute, does design or whatever through modules. That would be the one that would be super exciting. It will happen. I could probably figure out how to do it 
in parts already, but it's going to get polished. By the end of the year, I think we'll see something like this in action. Nice. My prediction. Yeah. And hardware-wise, I like compact things. You know, this is this is the thing that I'm trying to always figure out, like how do you can carry everything on your backpack, you know, one backpack and maybe a little shoulder bag. You know, it's uh, how to keep things minimal. You know, there, there's some interesting tools and a couple of interesting laptops. I like the ones, laptops with it, like the ones that fold out and got two sides, you know, two screens almost. These are good for um, like the touch screen stuff. And if they get more performer and you get higher graphics card options on it, that'll be super as well. I guess that's pretty much it from that point of view, but I think we'll definitely see prompt engineering to the visuals on the rise in the next months and years for sure. Awesome. Yeah, this has been super fun. I guess to cap it all off, can you give us like one piece of advice or is there something you want to say to the VGA community? That, uh, that might help them out, get on the right path as a VJ. My advice would be stay true to yourself, do something towards your creative admirations daily. You know, keep asking questions and keep evolving. Never give up. Find the love in yourself for the art that you do and you want to share with the world. This will put you in a good space towards where you will grow and where you will go. This is what I suggest. So follow your dreams and keep doing it every day. I'd say that that's my biggest advice for anyone. Is it? Thank you, Greg. This has been a a really fun conversation. Pleasure, Sean. It was wonderful. Check out vjunion.io. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always want to say VJ Union. It is like that. All the VJ Union Facebook groups, vdmo.com. I'm launching a site soon, actually, so I'll I'll let people know when it's up. Sweet. Yeah, we'll have links to everything. Uh, Get in touch with Greg. Join the community. And yeah, thanks for watching. Thank you so much.